Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Baseball Podcast. It is me, Joey P. Joe P. Zapia. And today, we're continuing our onslaught of all teams. That's right. We had our all breakout team yesterday with Ariel Cohn. Then we had our all bust team, which was very depressing with Jason Collette. But today, we've got one of the greats, a legitimate journalist with us, the one, the only Steve Gardner from USA Today to help us do the all sleeper team. Thank you. And Steve Gardner, you, you, and I mean legitimate, like you vote for the Hall of Fame. It's been year three of you doing that i feel like when you got that ability it was like something for all of us all of a sudden we can vicariously live through you after all these years so i want to know who made your ballot for 2022 uh, slash 23 who, who was on there who'd you vote for well uh i i liked i'm a big hall guy i didn't think i was going to be until i actually had the vote and the ballot in my hand but um i i voted for nine ten this year i voted for seven i believe um, Scott Rowland for one, congratulations to him. Uh, Todd Helton might make it in this next year. I voted for him, voted for Billy Wagner, um, voted for Andrew Jones, Gary Sheffield, Carlos Beltran, first year on the ballot, and um, also Jimmy Rollins. So those were my guys, and uh, I, I felt pretty good about it. Um, not not going to uh, get into the, the mix with Alex Rodriguez and Manny Ramirez, those guys. Um, just because they they failed their drug test. And if you do that, you know, now that Major League Baseball has been testing for that for a long, long time, um, that's that's kind of a disqualifier for me. And uh, so that's that's kind of how my mindset was. And, and that is absolutely 100% fair. Uh, Welsh knows I can't get enough of the steroid era of baseball. I want it all day long. Uh, <laughs> I want those guys all back. Everybody just monitor everybody. Just, you know. When grandma falls down, breaks her hip, they give her steroids. You know, I'm just saying, like, maybe well, you we can know, monitor I'm the same these way things. Too. I, I think that's a, I, you know? I would say that I do <laughs> think your opinion. I'm giving no, here. Well, I don't think I it's opinion, but I think that's one of the problems with baseball though, is like, Steve, you can have that opinion. And I think a lot of people share that, but then there's literally the exact opposite opinions. And I think having that big of a gap and that baseball can't step in and figure out and just be like, Hey, you need, you can't consider this or you like, I think this is what makes this whole thing messy because there are, because I don't personally agree. Uh, I, I go on the stats, I go on the players. There might've been cheating. There was cheating in the seventies in different ways and stuff like that. So to me, it's a non-factor, but Mm -hmm. like that baseball doesn't come in and step in and try to get this fixed. It kind of stinks because then, you know, you're everyone's put in a weird situation. Like Steve, you're put in a weird situation, especially if someone wants to do like a gotcha with the steroid guys, you just have the perfect argument, but it's like you and the next hall of fame, uh, writer who's voting could have completely different ideological reasons. But it pushes it off to the peers now. Like, I think that's that's it, right? Like you're sort of, you're, you're allowing now the, the players that they played with to vote them in. And I, and I think that is, a perfectly good way of doing it also i mean i i didn't think we we're gonna get this deep into the whole face up but i love i yeah. could talk about this all the Steve's time here. you know one other thing you know? though before the testing you know barry bonds roger clemens i'm perfectly fine with those guys and was perfectly fine until they dropped off the ballot it's just that once major league baseball finally took a stand you know mm-hmm. and bud selig wasn't just saying go ahead um I don't see anything. We're making lots right. of money. You know, once you have the testing and people test positive, that to me is the difference between I gotcha. the Manny Ramirez and the A-Rods versus the Bonses and the Clemenses. Thank goodness Makes for a lot you. Of sense. Steve Gardner, voice of reason. In I'm a glad you clarified world. that too, because I don't think I knew that, Steve, that that's where your stance was on those yeah. guys, because you it's just, I think stance. it's really important that you differentiated those two, because I kind of assumed you were clumping all of that in together. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense of what you're saying. Why you, you do? I don't have a line somewhere, and that's where right. I particularly choose to draw it. And um, at least that way, I try and stay consistent. And that's, yeah, that is consistent. You know, that's what you want if you're, you know, listening to people's arguments. Uh, as long as they don't, you know, go all over the place and uh, say it's it's good this way and bad that way, um, you just have to have some consistency. And that's what I try and do. Now, yeah. I don't know if any of the names we're going to talk about today are going to end up on the ballot for the Hall of Fame, voted by. Steve Gardner, but we're going to get to some of these names because they should be on some of your draft lists. So let's start here with the all sleeper team. These are the, again, sleepers are a notion that gets overdone, overwrought, but really players that are undervalued, underrated, maybe underappreciated. And that's what we're trying to do is give some love here. I I do want to tell you, I struggled with this one because we just did Mm -hmm. the all breakout team and I'm not going to lie to you guys. 
that the all breakout, the all sleeper kind of live in a similar, uh, they, they live in a similar building. They might be on different floors, but they're in a similar mm. building. So like I had to work a little bit harder to not throw all the names that you guys expect. I think I did throw one that I just can't help but put on here because I think they qualify at both, but they kind of do. I, I, I even did this by the way. And we've talked about this a gajillion times. I was like, what is the definition that the internet says of sleeper? Because well, I think there, there's like I mean, 400 the different ways of killed it. sleepers because that's the problem is everybody talks about them so much that they end up becoming inflated almost. And then they have to return too much of whatever that perspective value is. And that becomes yeah. the trouble here. But I think this list you guys put together is really good. So let's start with good. the catcher here. Welsh, why don't you kick things off with yours, which is actually a player we talked about with Frank Stample. We talked about with Ariel yeah. Cohen, a catcher who made this team for you, Logan O'Hoppy. Yeah, and I think, uh, again, I don't know which one you guys would all kind of define. What's better, the all-sleeper or the all-breakout team? I think he kind of fits into both. Uh, Logan O'Hoppy, I completely agreed with it when it was brought up. Almost his entire minor league career, it's a sub-20% K percentage, good walk percentage, good batting average, has really big power. Uh, I personally love the guy. It's a unique little fact about him. He loves to talk to fans. He did this in the AFL. He would walk up. He would stand right by the nets. He would turn around and he would just start talking to people. And one time there were these two guys. I'm not going to go along about this. They were talking about Bryson Stott and they were like, oh, did you know that Bryson Stott is blah, blah, blah. This in Baseball America's uh, ranks. And Logan Hoppy turned around to these gentlemen just sitting there in, in the stands watching this game. And he goes, that's too low. And Logan Hoppy's like, that's too low for Bryson Stott. And I always just, I always got a kick out of that. It's my weird anecdotal thing with O'Hoppy. But like in his own right, he was such a talented and is such a talented player. He hit uh, 15 homers with the Phillies in double A last year and 11 with the Angels. There's big power. It's being undersold by projections. I personally believe the low K rate gives him a really good low baseline and he's essentially almost had a 200 ISO. It's probably around 190 his entire career that that really can equate to 20 plus home run power. If he can take over the gig from Max Stassi, I think he's a massive sleeper. He goes outside of like the top 20 in catchers. He's a no brainer in two catcher leagues. And if you fall flat kind of in a 15 team, I would try to pick him up and see if he can take a majority of the gig because he's got 20 plus home run power in him easy. Now, Steve, you got a veteran on your list, which is great because I love that because to me, sleepers are not always just the young players, the unproven players. Sometimes it's undervalued veterans and yours is Yasmani Grandal. Yeah, uh, I, I, I liked him um, for, for several years just because of the plate patience and the ability to hit for power. And he had none of that really last year. It was just a lost season for him. Injuries to the back, the knee, everything. But from all indications, he's healthy this spring. And the White Sox, you know, had injuries up and down the roster last year. So it was kind of a lost season. You know, there was the Tony La Russa uh, ex uh, experiment, uh, experience, whatever you want to call it. It wasn't great for the White Sox. So I think everybody suffered there. And you look at Grundahl, he's got a track record for power, had four consecutive 20-plus homer seasons um, from 2016 to 2019, uh, and then hit 20 three of them in 2021. So he still got the power. Uh, and if he's healthy, this is a, this is a solid white Sox lineup. And I think he's getting overlooked outside of the top 200 for sure. And, uh, and I think he's somebody that you could definitely get late and be very happy with. I'm fascinated to see what that white Sox lineup is when it's healthy. And now that Tony La Russa is not in the dugout. Like I kind of want to see the combination of that and see what this team Sleeping. becomes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's get to the first baseman here. Welsh, why don't you kick things off? Who made your first base list for the all sleeper team of 23? Qualifies, I think, at multiple of the breakout or sleeper conversation, but I'm going to do it, especially when you look at ADP here. It is Miguel Vargas, and we've talked a ton about him. This is in that rookie camp. Uh, Miguel Vargas shows up at first base as the 29th first baseman, still with an overall ADP outside the top 200. The only place I think is CBS where he's inside the top 100. Also, I don't think I've seen this across the board. We've talked a lot about like projections and stuff that. The, there's the bat and the bat X by Derek Cardi and the bat X I think has a few more ballpark factors. Miguel Vargas breaks his system because in the bat, the normal bat, he's projected 20 homers with 10 stolen bases. The bat X is 13 homers, six stolen bases with a really, really high batting average, low strikeouts. Again, I love playing that 
and he's a cheat code because he's going to qualify at second base. He's going to have that gig all year. Miguel Vargas had that little, uh, I think it was a hairline fracture in his wrist or his finger, and he hasn't been swinging, and he's still getting walked. Like He's just such a unique individual who's going to steal, who's going to hit homers. He might not be your traditional first baseman, but how often can you get double-digit stolen bases out of a first baseman who will also quite a, uh, qualify to position you're going to move him out? So if you want to talk about sleepers, getting a guy for a high-powered offense that'll have multi-position eligibility and is a a really, really high floor prospect. Getting him outside the top 200 is big time sleeper team stuff. So uh, I'm going to pick Miguel Vargas as my first baseman here. All right, over to you. Your first baseman for 2023 all sleeper team is who, Steve? Well, it's Brandon Belt, another old veteran um, and another injury problem from, from last year. But I like the situation. Everything seems to be lining up well for him going from San Francisco to Toronto. Number one, uh, apparently the knee is fine. Um, they're tr still trying to bring him along kind of slowly this spring, but you know, all indications are he feels fine. And uh, you know, coming off a lost season last year, he had 29 home runs two years ago. You know, in San Francisco. Now he comes to Toronto where they brought the fences in especially for left-handed power. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be enticing for him. And the fact that he's going to be able to DH and, and do that against primarily right-handed pitching. So, you know, he's got a barrel rates and, and uh, up with the, the, the top players in the major leagues. I, I think uh, 94th percentile barrel rate in 2021, 96th percentile last year, despite the injuries. Um, I, he knows how to hit it. And uh, I think in Toronto, that's a great place for Brandon Belt to land. So even though he's 34 or something like that, uh, I think he's got a shot at possibly even hitting 30 homers this year. You know, Brandon Belt's a fascinating wow. case. I always wonder if he had stayed healthy and not played in that ballpark for his whole right. career, what Brandon Belt might have been. Because in the minor leagues, this was a guy who, you know, that rare elite three, four, five slash where you 300, 400 OBP, mm -hmm. 500 slugging. You know, when you see that in a player, that's usually a special indicator. And most of the players that have that in the minor leagues, they tend to become really good players in the major leagues. And you look back at what Brandon Belt was doing back then and what he could have been. And it's one of those classic what if stories. But you're right. In Toronto, perhaps a player that's being grossly underappreciated, undervalued too. And, in deeper leagues, you should pay attention to, especially with corner being so tough this year. I mean, corner is a, you know, you get, it's very top heavy at first and third. <laughs> it's just, yeah. That's all you could say about it. All right, let's continue on with the infield here. Let's go to second base. Welsh, you are up. Who is on the second base side for you in the all sleeper realm? Uh, I went deeper than I think I've probably gone, I guess, on these last couple names. This is a guy that I find myself drafting really at every single spot that I possibly can uh, in deeper leagues. If I miss out on second base, middle infield, he's a target. And it's Colton Wong with the Seattle Mariners, 15 and 17 quietly last year with Milwaukee while hitting 251. Uh, projections see double digits on both sides again. Does not strike out a whole bunch is another thing you can consider hitting theoretically at the top of a Seattle lineup, I think really works in his favor. And I think the run totals could come up. I don't think the RBIs will come up. I think he could run a little bit more. We talk about, you know, where will all these new found stolen bases come from? Top, middle, bottom. I think those mm -hmm. middle guys really stand out to me as players that could move into a next level of stolen bases. Would not be shocked if Colton Wong dropped into 20. And if you got 15, 20 out of him, even if you got, even if you got 15, 15, or 10, 15, either of all of those will break the ADP that he is coming at, where it's in like the 250s, just a 28 yeah, he's second base. Yeah, nine on Fantasy Pros. And if you want to see that again, fantasypros.com slash rankings, you can see uh, the rankings there for the MLB. And 249, I agree with you. In those Roto formats where you're 28. looking at the deeper spots for corner guys, I mean, uh, middle infielders, why not? 28th second baseman when you look at the aggregate yeah, yeah. on fantasy pros here it stands and if he gets to the top of that order welsh that's the big key. that's a game changer that's a game changer yeah. with colton long oh yeah and again doesn't strike out a whole bunch he can walk makes pretty solid contact and you're in a spot here where this team likes to run they're gonna they're not quite the powerhouse that maybe some of these other teams are i think there's a little bit of manufacturing that happens in general but what if kelnick is rocking julio keeps going and you've got colton long near that top of the lineup it's a recipe for a huge sleeper at the middle infield at a position that not everybody likes at second base 
And when you're practicing all those mock drafts over at the Draft Wizard at mm -hmm. Fantasy Pros, I mean, this is a great opportunity for you to go and look for some of these guys too and see where these ADPs are, especially if you're in those deeper leagues. I mean, to me, that's why it's such a great tool because you could really start to find some of these guys where they're buried in the ADP. And again, if you haven't already checked it out, check it out. Fantasypros.com slash Draft Wizard. Go there, run some mock draft simulations. You can run by yourself. The mock draft lobby is open. You can draft against other people. You can send links and create them with just your friends or your enemies, however you want to do it. Fantasybros.com slash draft wizard or just download the app. The app is the way to go. Apps are great. It's an app for everything, except for uh, you know, for what, what isn't there an app for at this point? Well, shit, there's point. there's I mean, uh, apps, there's that's appetizers. One, that's yeah, what we I, need. there you go. App, well, uh, yeah. the sleeper app, uh, there's kind of that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right, so Sorry. let's uh, let's continue on here. Let's get you a second baseman here for your team. Who is it, uh, Steve Gardner? I'm going with Tyro Estrada. Um, again, you know, uh, Welsh goes a little bit deeper. I'm a little shallower this time and a little younger than my other twos uh, that, I, that I've picked so far. He's entering age 27 season. Um, and I, I don't think he's getting anywhere near the love that he should have. I'll tell you a quick story from last year. I had Tyro Estrada in the FSGA uh, Champions League and was looking to make a trade to get some more pitching. I had Carlos Correa as well on that team. And I was looking to see who I could trade. And in checking out their stats, Estrada was right there in terms of productivity with Carlos Correa. And I was like, you know what? I could trade Carlos Correa, get pitching, and just plug Estrada in as my short stop, and I'll be fine. And it worked out tremendously. Uh, I think I got like Blake Snell for Carlos Correa. Blake Snell went on a heater the second half of the season um, and carried me to a championship. Can I say that here uh, with the, <laughs> humbly? Um, of course you can. So you can brag that, all day. Maybe that wasn't uh, the key to it, wasn't the only thing. But I still think I, even looking at his his stats and, and where he's sitting, um, I had to move him up in my rankings. I was even undervaluing him. Uh, in my rankings this year. So yeah, first year, last year, played more than 55 games for the first time, had 14 homers, 21 steals. Now he's got the job all to himself. He doesn't have to worry about anybody looking over his shoulder. He could be a 2020 guy. And, you know, he's, I think, 150, somewhere in there in terms of ADP. That's that's a pretty good guy to have on your roster, and he can play also shortstop or second. So I'll slot him here at second base and uh, be very happy. You know, the power is something with him that I'm slightly concerned with. But if you look at the minor league track record, he had 286 for his minor league career, 500 plus games. So that's a pretty good sample. So there might be an uptick in batting average that we haven't seen yet as well. I think I might buy that before more of the power. But you're right. I think Estrada is one of those players that. People last year kept waiting for the bottom to drop out and it just mm -hmm. never quite did. And he was just a very productive player. And there's certainly opportunity for him this year. Let's go over to third base to the hot corner. Who is a hot sleeper for you, the Welsh? Well, I went with the Max Muncy, the Max Muncy with mm -hmm. the Los Angeles Dodgers. You know, he's actually funny. I was taking a look. I was like, is there an advantage on the shift? I, I just want to throw this anomaly out to you guys. When you talk about, you know, the shift uh, could change some of these guys. He actually had a 331 Woba being shifted and 220 Woba on non shift. So that's like a really weird, unique one, but he's like a weird, Ooh. unique uh, contact type of player hit. What was the second lowest or third lowest of his career hitting under 200. It was the third lowest in those same years where he had really low BABIPs that were like under 230. He would hit under 200. That's a little bit of an anomaly. He also got very, one of the things if you're looking at the game, I hope he can fix is he got really pull centric. And that also led to him being like uh, getting the, ball really high up in there is what I'm trying to tell you. Like he had a 20 mm -hmm. percent. Uh, where was it? A 20 percent launch angle or a 20 degree launch angle, which was like five higher than the previous. And that coincided with his pull rate being astronomically bigger than usual. Guy was pressing the whole year while also suffering injuries. Projection systems are not on that. Max Muncy is going to have another sub 200 batting average. Uh, the bat X is at 236. The highest is actually the bat at 247. He's got 30 home run potential, can be a little bit higher in a lineup with the Dodgers. He can move around a little bit. The position's not great. I'll take 30 home run power on one of the best offenses in baseball. I guess I got two Dodgers already in here, but there's reason <laughs> to be because he is cheaper than in previous years. One of the things that almost made me not put him on here was he still is a little costly, it felt like, when I've seen in drafts, but... On the Fantasy Pros Consensus ADP, he's actually the ninth third baseman, but at a 132 ADP. 30-plus homers is worth right around a 100 overall pick. 
at a really bad position. I'm going to go with Mount, uh, Max Muncy on the bounce back, and I think he's a sleeper. I know we're not going back and forth in every single player here, but Steve, what are your thoughts on Max Muncy? Because this is one that I have a tough time with. Whenever you hit a buck 94 in a season, to me, that's a huge red flag. Like something totally. else is wrong. I don't know if he's just hit his limit. I don't know if it was just the injuries, whatever it was. Welsh is right. There's still power there. He's still at the 21 home runs in 136 games. But I mean, I could find 20 home runs from Brandon Drury or maybe Jose Miranda or Matt Chapman a few rounds later. So is there any plus to taking Max Muncy or is he a sleeper? And Welsh is just saying, hey, this is a down year. Wipe it away and then just continue on. Yeah, I think last year his numbers were skewed a bit because of the elbow injury and coming along slowly in spring training. I think he may have rushed to get ready for the season. And then when you do that, sometimes your performance is not what it should be. I think he hit a lot better towards the end of the season. So I'm willing to give him a pass for last year. And you look at his track record, too. I mean, he is very consistent, especially in terms of power. Um, over the last several seasons that it makes last year look like the anomaly. So I, I know you won't get a great batting average, but you know that you will get power. And at third base, you need power. And uh, and I think that's, you know, he's a guy that I've been targeting. I haven't gotten yet in, in drafts, but I would not mind having Max Muncy at all. And, as, and to Steve's point, he hit 230 in the second half of the season. So if you want to look, 230 is not the greatest thing in the world. But I, was say, it, I don't know if that's really helping. But it's, what I want to point bitter, out, though, <laughs> when he was hitting great. 230, though, when he was a 230, 240 guy, he was going easy inside the top 100. And now, you know, you're going around 130, maybe even a little bit later. Just kind of some fun qualifications you can get out of him. But I thought this was a tough one. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought third base finding third base a sleeper you know third baseman. Is? Draft tough. Austin Riley. That's my answer. Um, uh, let's <laughs> move on to, uh, of course, Steve's an overachiever. He's got two names here potentially for third base. So is this a position battle? What's going on? Uh, well, you know, I started to think that DJ LeMay, he was one of those, you know, bounce back guys for last year, but I didn't want to have too many of those injury bounce back guys mm -hmm. because, you know, I kind of get in a rut. I like a little variety. So I'm going to go a little <laughs> bit deeper, you know, whilst, whilst taking Max Muncy, who's, you know, got a pretty decent ADP. I'm going way into like 300 Jamer Candelario. All right. Hear me out on this one. Okay. Everybody hates the Washington Nationals this year. They're, they may be the worst team in baseball, but I, I think they made a smart move in getting Candelario because he, coming off a bad year with the Tigers, everybody had a bad year with the Tigers, kind of the, the White Sox syndrome. But mm -hmm. you look at two years ago, he had 61 extra base hits, 16 homers, 42 doubles, playing his home games in Comerica, which is one of the toughest, if not the toughest, pitchers park in all of major league baseball uh, so much that they had to move the fences in he then goes to washington where he's pretty much the unquestioned starter he's going to get a lot of opportunity there and those doubles that he hit in detroit could very well turn into at least some of them into home runs in washington so uh they don't have a whole lot but he's going to hit higher in the lineup and we've seen many times examples of bad teams but if you hit you know i think of the pirates with with brian reynolds and mm -hmm. brian hayes and those guys you know they're going to get so many plate opportunities and they'll eventually you know, at least if they're not putting up great you know batting averages and stuff they're going to get you counting stats and i think that's where candelario can really be a factor and help people because he's practically free in drafts and Candelario is definitely free. Uh, ADP of 430. He was also good in the yeah. 2020 COVID shortened season too. Uh, mm -hmm. He had a good season there. He hit 297 at seven home runs at 52 games. So it's not like, uh, again, it's playing time. That's what it's all about. And there's nobody else to take it away from him. Same thing, reason we like CJ Abrams so much on this show. We always say it's free. I mean, go take yep. it. Now, shortstop, by the way, CJ Abrams made your list. So we might as well stay with you. Since you're going on the all national side of the left side here on the infield, I don't know. Steve, maybe maybe there's a little uh, local bias here. Uh, maybe I need a reason to watch the Nationals uh, <laughs> here in the DC area. So, uh, but no, I, I like C.J. Abrams. Obviously, you know, coming to Washington in the Juan Soto trade, um, lots of prospect hype, um, and and well, she probably know a lot more about C.J. Abrams and his growth than I do, but. He's still only 22, and that's what I like. The fact that he's got room to grow, 
He's got room to grow physically and as a baseball player. And there's still that speed. And uh, I think this year, we talk about the bases being a little bit larger, the pickoff rules, things like that. I think that's tailor-made for C.J. Abrams to take advantage of. And so in Washington, they want him to settle into the leadoff spot. The Nationals, you know, ever since Trey Turner left, have not really had a leadoff guy. C.J. Abrams could be that guy for them. And, uh, you know, again, just multiple plate, you know, plate opportunities, chances to get on base, um, like to see the OBP a little higher. I think he can do that. And once he does get on base, you know, it's off to the races. So uh, C.J. Abrams, again, not getting a whole lot of love in terms of ADP, but he's got a lot of room to grow. And I think that, uh, you know, maybe he takes that step forward this year. Yeah, he's getting a lot of love on this show because, again, yeah. cheap. He's got the job. He's got upside. Just be patient, you know, because the Nationals have to be patient with him, too. They have to show something. I keep mm-hmm. saying it. They have to show something for that trade. I, See, Jeremy's going to have to be that guy. And look, he's not going to be Juan Soto. Nobody's going to be Juan Soto. That's why he's so special. But can you get a good everyday player? And I think the answer is yes. I think I had him on my all, all breakout team, too. I think, I think he was my did. second baseman. I, and yeah, I've I mean, talked about him before. Yeah. I'm thinking like guys outside of ADP. I think we did a when we did a show on that, that I, he was on my list. So. A lot of people smarter than me and Welsh. See, Steve Gardner mm-hmm. over there talking about it. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's get to your shortstop. And this is one of my favorite guys. One of my favorite guys last year. We talked about him so much. And all he did last year was hit 31 home runs. Let's talk about him. Go ahead, Welsh. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm turning even more and more. And I've, I'm gluing this all in with my dislike of this back end of the deep shortstops uh, that we really hit like on your in air the, quotes the bust the episode. There. Yeah, the deep. Yeah, yeah uh-huh. just like in that muddy water of those back end guys, the only one that I really like is Willie Adamas and Willie Adamas. I, I think it's just so impressive that you can have a career low batting average under a career low BABIP and you have a career high in home runs. He also his RBIs were through the roof. He really found a spot and a place to hit. He's a 200 ISO guy. He also lowered his strike. Think of this, think of this His batting average <laughs> and his BABIP were lower BABIP equating to batting average dip down. He also lowered his strikeout percentage from the previous year, 26%, which was tied, if you want to get into the decimals, it was a little bit higher than one year, but 26% is a career best of what he can do. So he lowered his strikeout percentage while struggling uh, from BABIP. The homers were there. Projections want the batting average to kick back up because the BABIP tells us the story it is, but the homers don't. I don't buy that. I think Willie Adams could be a 35 homer player, and when he's sitting around a territory of a, a consistently inconsistent Carlos Correa with injury worries, Tim Anderson who can't play 120 games, and a litany of a couple other players, I just think Willie Adams is one of the better deals. I think he's a sleeper, even though this is like a top 100 guy. I think Willie Adams has got top 50 upside that you're getting. ADP shows around 90. I've seen him go post 100 in plenty of drafts. And he's actually really not the target when everyone's like, oh, the position's so deep. Give me Tim Anderson. No one's trying to get Willie Adamas. And I well, am. Well, isn't it every is. year we do this to ourselves where we go, oh, this is the really deep position. And then like by June, we look sure. up and go, what happened to that position? It just got decimated <laughs> or whatever it is. And you know what? Just because it's deep, like don't take it for granted. You know, if you can get that's Willie my at, point. Yeah. And if you can get Willie at your middle infield spot somehow, it's my favorite thing it. to do. Now, Joey, it's my do favorite it. thing to do. That's it right there is um, I want one of those higher end shortstops if I am you know, given See, the I'm, ability. I'm, I'm but I also want a Domus. Because it's good. I, wanna, I don't care. Like, I'm I not chasing take the other things. I'm chasing the, talent. I want to take him off the pool, though, too, because everyone's like, right. oh, it's so deep. I want him to be gone. I want him at my middle infield. Your middle infield this year most likely should be a shortstop. I don't really want it to be Jeremy Pena. I don't need it to be Carlos Correa. I love the depth. If I were to go and take an O'Neill Cruz, I'm taking on a lot of batting average risk, but I don't even hate the idea of getting Willie Adamas because, you know, if I've got some insecurity at shortstop specifically with him, I want another guy. Tim Anderson might be better for injury. You know, it's funny. I was looking at the Wander Franco home road splits today too, and he struggled at home last year. And I just, you know, that batter's eye is just not great in Tampa. And I just... I know Wander Franco's not going anywhere for the next, I don't know, 500 years. He's in that contract and how long it is. But you see these guys when they get out of Tampa, what they're able to do. It's, you I know, mean, it's crazy. You know, it's funny about Willie Adamas, too. If everyone doesn't remember, Willie Adamas was actually the core piece when David Price was traded and yeah, no one knew who the right. hell he was. Everyone was like, who is this <laughs> Willie? What was this trade? Well, you looked at David Price, you're like, what is this trade about? And everyone's like, watch out for Willie Adamas, who's at the Tiger system. Mm-hmm. And now Willie Adamas, you know, he is, uh, I mean, imagine trading David Price for Willie Adamas right now. Just think about that. <laughs> All right, let's get to the outfielders here. And on your list, Steve Gardner, you've got 
Jesse Winker, who is one of my favorite guys I keep talking about because he, he was one of my biggest stayaways last year. And he's one of my biggest targets this year because it's all business. It's not personal with me. The ADP is free in Milwaukee, by the way. Love these guys in Milwaukee. Oscar Colas and Harrison Bader. So let's talk about these three guys, your outfielders. What's special about them potentially in 2023 where you think they're sleepers? All right. Uh, Winker, obviously we like the hitting environment in Milwaukee. So mm -hmm. coming back to the National League where he had so much success in Cincinnati, playing in the NL Central. Um, and, and he's healthy too. Again, the, that's kind of a theme that runs through uh, a lot of these sleepers for me. Um, the neck and the knee and whatever else he had go wrong. Um, you know, personality conflicts or clashes in Seattle. Um, but deep down, there's still that all-star from 2021 that hit 305, 394, 556 in Cincinnati. Um, and, you know, the one thing that you could knock him for in that all-star season was that he didn't hit left-handed pitching well, um, had just like a, a OPS under 600 against left-handed pitching. He hit left-handed pitching better than he hit right-handed pitching last year. So you put all that together, healthy in Milwaukee, Taking advantage of that, I see a, a big bounce back from Jesse Winker. Love that. Let's talk about the other guys, too. It's it's funny. You know, Welsh, I say the same things, but it sounds much better when Gardner says it, doesn't it? It sounds much smarter. <laughs> well, when a Hall of Famer uh, mentions it, when a yeah, fantasy, when a fantasy baseball yeah. Hall of Famer uh, so much starts more talking about him. Yeah. 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 I'm, yeah. I'm an idiot. Weight. He's much better. All right, so all right, so let's get to Oscar Colas, which is one of Welsh's guys in Bader. Give me your, uh, your lowdown on those two. Okay, Bader, I think um, another one of those guys that has the potential to steal a ton of bases this year. Obviously, with the Yankees, um, they're going to have to worry about, uh, you know, opponents will have to worry about Aaron Judge. And and I think this is an opportunity. Bader's going to be full-time center fielder. He's the, the only center fielder really on the roster. So he's going to be in the lineup every single day. Um, and he was putting together a succession of, of better slugging seasons in St. Louis until the injuries last year um, had a 460 slugging percentage in 2021. Um, I, I think he's got the potential to hit 20 home runs there in New York and steal 20, maybe 30 bases if he can stay healthy. Uh, I think the potential is there in New York that that Harrison Bader can continue his growth and be you know a a factor there for the Yankees on on a team that really needs him. You know, uh, I think they showed when Aaron Judge was kind of carrying them through all of the second half of last year, they needed somebody like Bader to come in. And he did um, perform for them in the postseason. But getting a full season there in New York, I think, can only help him. All right. And Colos, a player who's going, again, pretty much free, 372, Chicago yeah. White Sox. We know the talent that he brings potentially is is the matter of how much playing time he's going to get. And do you think he is going to be one of these guys from the jump that gets it? Yeah, this could be, you know, uh, he may be playing for a job, a starting job in spring training. I think he's going to make the roster. Um, he progressed through the minor leagues, was very successful at, at AA and AAA last year. And the only guy in front of him, it seems like, is Gavin Sheets. And when you've got a 24-year-old with this kind of raw talent, um, I, I don't think that it's going to take him long to overtake Sheets. Uh, the one issue with him in the minor leagues is the strikeout rate, and he's done exceptionally well in improving on that so far this spring obviously small sample sizes but you've got a guy who can you know hit for power can steal bases and uh, you know if he's not striking out there's a better chance he's going to be getting on base again i like the bounce back for all of this you know white Sox offense yeah. and colos could be part of that um and a very big part of that now it's a special day on the show because we're recording this on the 9th of march and welsh uh, I, I had the the over on this, but you've hit the under the amount of times you can mention Lars Newtbar. So uh, that's it. <laughs> you've now officially you're done. Right. You've hit your limit. The quota is done. So the rest of the year, you can't mention him. But he is one of your three outfielders. So if you want to mention him, you can. But just oh. know this is it for you. I'm going to do the other guy. But like you I, I, do the other guy. But I told just so everybody knows. Newt Barr was on the list here because Welsh Listen, is a man crush on him for sure. I was also going to put Jeffrey Springs, but like, I just can't keep doing, I understand it, but I was just struggling with it. Like I am so susceptible by the way, if Corbin Carroll and Lars Newt are not good this year. <sighs> well, look, I'm going to hear it. It's I, I, I'll rough. say this, uh, Corbin Carroll, uh, you know, I'm all in on, I mean, yeah. uh, the more I watch Same. tape, Same. the more I watch, it's just, I think he's just such a, it's just, he, I've been the his conductor. hands are so like, fast Welsh. He's got <laughs> such strong, quick hands to the baseball. 
his athleticism. I just wrote this up in a piece for Fantasy Pros, too. It's up on there. My must-haves. He's one of my must-haves this year. I think he's almost slump-proof because of the athleticism, because of the quick stroke, because, <laughs> like, the amount of at bats he's going to get. I know, like, maybe I'm jinxing it, but I, I really don't <laughs> I mean, think that so, That was Walsh. a little jinxy, but, like, I'm with you. I agree but with Walsh, I mean, uh, honestly, you know like, to, on this show the last couple of years, and, oh, I mean, how many years have we been doing shows together? Yeah. When you and I agree on a player and we're this excited, how often are we wrong? Yeah, are no, we really I mean, not. So like, I'm aggressive. We, we did like bold predictions last year and mine were the silliest ever and they weren't like an agreement. This is a full agreement. And it's just like yeah. I said, I'm just the conductor of these trains. There's a lot of people with it and with me on it. Uh, it's just it's very tied to it. Lars Dupar is another one of those. I've talked about it at nauseum. But like if you're talking about a all sleeper ad nauseum team, is true. That's, he that's belongs accurate. on my sleeper. Here's the other guy then okay. that I, I can pivot to is Taylor Ward. I think Taylor Ward is coming at an exception exceptional cost outside the top 100 you're probably looking easily at a 20 to 25 home run season batting average is 280 last year xba maintained almost a 270 hits both righty and lefties good hit 268 against lefties 286 against righties and maintained both halves which is pretty solid 286 in the first half 275 in the second half just a consistent hitter that's going to have a lot of opportunity for run and rbi in that um that angels lineup and i think he's a pretty good deal my other outfielders that i threw out to you i'm actually gonna pivot uh, i want to give you this guy first this is a cheating one but i want to talk about him because he's not technically an outfielder anymore cheat. yeah but we don't get to talk about d we don't talk about util guys in any of these things that i love done. it i drafted him yesterday and he, so, i drafted him at, i drafted him yesterday in the league and i drafted him today in the rest slam i drafted and that's him why i wanted to bring up just there and it's another ridiculous another dodger in J.D. Martinez. And I know he's not technically an outfielder, but J.D. Martinez is uh, it's cheat code stuff with the Dodgers. Still hit 274 last year, but obviously struggled totally offensively. Batting average looks like it's going to maintain. Projections love a huge bounce back in power to the 25 range. And I guess at the end of the day, like I'm not, I like a lot of the Dodgers, but it's just, a, why wouldn't you? It's a big, huge, powerful lineup. And I keep picking on Dodgers that are coming at costs that are way cheaper than they were in previous years and they're bounce back mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, M Muncie and, and, uh, and JD Martinez are bounce backs. Miguel Vargas just hasn't gone there. I think he's just kind of a no brainer that everyone forgets about. Cause he's util only don't think he's going to yeah, get exactly the outfield it. stuff, but you, he, forget, he's just they a get great lazy. They don't sort in the draft. And how many guys are sitting there where he is an ADP where you could legit say there's a chance he goes 30, 90. Like that, yeah. that's, that's absolutely in the range of outcomes for him. And it's not absurd. Like it's just, he came off a down year. We're going to know right away. I think in the first month or two, if JD Martinez is washed or if JD Martinez is going to have a Renaissance, I really do go ahead, Steve. You know, guys, there's another reason that I'm bullish on JD Martinez as well. Coming to the Dodgers, they hired the guy that turned his swing around. Remember when JD Martinez was yep. essentially a nobody and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, wow, where did this come from? The guy's named Robert Van Skyok, um, and he wouldn't he wouldn't tell me. I remember interviewing him like the year after that, uh, and he wouldn't tell me the guy's name, and he wanted to keep it secret. He didn't want anybody going there. Uh, that finally got out, and the Dodgers hired him as as hitting coach or assistant hitting coach. Or he's he's with the Dodgers this year, so reuniting the two of them, you know, whatever might have been broken last year for J.D. Martinez. I think there's a pretty good chance that it gets fixed. It's yeah, 100 percent worth a shot at the ADP too. I think that's what Welsh is driving home. Yep. So you've got Taylor Ward, you've got Martinez, Newt Bar. I'll give you one more Welsh since I didn't let you use your Newt Bar today. Yeah, no, I wanted to talk about this one. This is important because I actually walked myself into this one because I was not about this guy <laughs> at all. I was on uh, bench with Bubba, our dear friend Casey Bubba, and we were talking about the Diamondbacks. Who will be on the show tomorrow, by the way, on the Friday uh, mock draft show. So there you go, go. and listen that. to that. Yeah, there you World's go. You guys can check us out. Together, well, in that show. I started to have this revelation about Lourdes Gurriel and I had brought up the idea. I said, listen, I'm not sold when you look at roster re roster resource tells you that Jake McCarthy's a guy. I don't believe in it. I don't know if the context skills are there enough. I also believe, you know, the stolen bases are going to come from Carol, whatever. It doesn't matter. I said, look out because the perfect type of guy to hit three for a team like this is actually a guy like Lourdes Gurriel. Well, you know what ended up happening? Spring started. He's starting almost every single game hitting three for the Diamondbacks. It's spring training. Things yeah. can change. Of course they can. But Corbin Carroll against righties leading off. Cattell Marte is firmly at two. And I want to point out in every one of these games, Cattell has hit two and Lourdes has hit three. Walker comes in at four. It seems like a foregone conclusion that Lourdes Gurriel is going to hit three. Now, why is that important? You have Corbin Carroll 
maybe going to lead the league in stolen bases, even if doesn't, is going to be a threat. The fastest man in baseball is your leadoff hitter. You've got Cattell Marte, who is noticeably trying to still hit for contact, not for power. Lourdes is not exciting, but he's dirt cheap. Dirt cheap. And what if those RBI numbers start to represent what he did in 2021 with the uh, with the Blue Jays? What if it's into the 80s? What if he gets to 15 homers? He's going to hit for a high batting average. I think it's a cheap, free opportunity when outfield stinks so bad that you might be able to get a couple really good mm-hmm. categories outside the top 200. And I just wanted to point out Lourdes Gurriel because I kind of walked myself into this him hitting three thing and it has been happening all spring long. And I think it's something we should really, really pay attention to for a Diamondback team that is going to try to manufacture. It might be a tiny bit better than a lot of people expect. All right, let's get to the pitchers here. Uh, The three pitchers on your list, Steve Gardner has actually got four because again, overachiever. Lucas Giolito, (laughs) one of my favorite bounce backs, also a guy I drafted yesterday in our Fantasy Pros draft. Freddy Peralta, who we've had mixed things about, so I want to definitely get your input on him. Tyler Molly and Tyler Anderson. So two Tylers, a Freddie P, and a Lucas G. So let's talk about these guys. Let's take them one at a time. First, Giolito, and then run through them for us here, Steve. All right. Uh, Giolito, I I think we have mutual love, the Welsh and I, um, on him. I I just – I think last year – Again, it's the White Sox thing. Maybe that's that's another theme for today. But where did that White Sox and Dodgers, come from? folks? That's yeah. the sleepers, right? Mm. Who would have thought? Where did that hey, 490 ERA ranch. come from? That's what I want to know. I mean, yeah. he'd been he turned things around since leaving Washington and going to Chicago. It's a huge buying opportunity. I mean, the K rate still above a strikeout per inning. Um, he's still missing bats last year uh, at the 71st percentile. I just it seems to me like there was just a mirage last year. And Giolito is a guy that can come back to ace level. Um, and again, you're talking about where he's going in ADP. I got him as my second starter in the AL labor draft um, over the past weekend. And he was $16, $17. And, uh, you know, he for was somebody who could 80 be... last year, by the way, can we, I mean, he was just yeah. out of shape. Yeah. Hey, you he mean, wait, yeah. He noticeably lost, he said he lost bad. like 35 pounds. Was yeah. I mean, he came up at 245 this year, but he was 280 last year. Yeah. I mean, obviously the mechanics had, you know, it threw that off. It threw off the stamina, it threw off everything. So, I mean, just coming into camp better shape. I think that hopefully is going to be enough, Steve. I'm with you hundred percent. What about Peralta? Cause that's a guy that's very polarizing because, Nick Pollock, I mean, literally, I didn't sleep the entire night after we had him on. He talked about Freddie Peralta's shoulder. Uh, but everybody keeps saying he's fine and he looks healthy in the spring. But what do you think? Well, I'm buying into the fact, and maybe I should be uh, taking this with a grain of salt, but if if they say that he's healthy and all indications are at this point that he's healthy entering spring training, then I love Freddie Peralta where he's going right now. I mean, we saw what he could do over a full season um, a couple years ago with that ERA under three, 195 Ks. And he just, the one thing I like about him the most is he doesn't give up hard contact and home runs. So, you know, when you can limit that in Milwaukee and get the, uh, you know, your team to hit a few extra home runs, um, that's where Freddie Peralta can be, you know, and he's not even the number one or the number two guy there in Milwaukee. He's their third starter. So the expectations aren't anything that he has to deal with. Um, and the strikeout rate again, high, it's been over 10 Ks per nine for, for a couple of years was down a little bit last year, but I attribute that to the injuries. I'm looking for the bounce back here and, and I'm buying at the dip. Okay, and then you got Tyler Molly and Tyler Anderson on your list. Let's talk about those two guys. Yeah, I'll get real quick again. Tyler Molly, two years ago, struck out 210 batters um, yeah. at a 375 ERA in Cincinnati in a pitcher's park. You put him in Minnesota with Carlos Correa, Brian Bu- uh, Byron Buxton, um, or Michael A. Taylor in center field. You know, those guys up the middle there, um, good defense. I think that's tailor-made for him to to come back and and be maybe not an ace, but certainly much better than the SP five or six or whatever he's being drafted. And Tyler Anderson, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, I mean, yes, he's not impressive to watch, but he does get ahead of hitters. That's one of the, he's one of the best in the majors at getting ahead of hitters or was last year. And that's what I think contributed a lot to his two, five, seven ERA and 1.00 whip Um, going to the angels. Um, it's different, you know, we won't have the Dodgers won't be shifting and, you know, they were the one, one of the best teams at shifting. Um, but still the mentality of getting ahead, 
Um, and nobody, it, they ch batters chase balls on him as much as they do almost any other pitcher in all of Major League Baseball. I think that's the kind of skill that can translate to a new environment. So um, Tyler Anderson, again, way outside the top 200. Uh, I'm buying. All right. Now, Welsh, you have Giolito on your list. Andrew Heaney, George Kirby. I don't know what more needs to be said about Giolito, but Welsh, if you got something there, drop it. Let's get to Heaney and Kirby as well. Why do these guys make your all sleeper team? Yeah, the, the only thing I would add with uh, Giolito as well, on, on top of the weight loss, he was pitching inside his body, and you could pretty visibly see it where he kept his arm uh, inside, kind of like really close to the vest, and then he would explode on it. That was something that uh, he changed from years prior, went to driveline again, that's gone. So he's kind of changed his delivery. He lost a whole bunch of weight. Uh, it seems very much like an anomaly. I'm just very much in on him. We've talked a lot about Kirby. I think Kirby was a big guy that um, Nick Pollock was in on and you know I've, I've kind of been pretty vocal about it as well i like the 9k per nine i love that he is a command zone pitcher he's just going to pump all across the zone with a multitude of pitches i think he's going to take a big step up i uh, love the spin rates i just love everything about george kirby i've seen him touch 100 as well so i, I think there's always something in the tank for him uh, a little bit bigger just saw him today actually in camp you know he's just adding a little bit more muscle onto his body i think george kirby set uh, to really break out and you know andrew haney is someone i haven't really talked about recently but like he was kind of jacob de grom light with what the Dodgers changed with him. He only had 70 innings last year, which is also Jacob DeGrom <laughs> light. Uh, but okay. You, Joe, you're giving me a, a weird I love look the reaction there, Joe 35.5 K percentage, which was over 13 K per nine of all pitchers who pitched 70 or more innings. Spencer Strider had the best K uh, minus walk percentage at 29.7. Number two, Andrew Heaney, 29.4%. The Dodgers, like they do, we're able to fix him. I'm very hopeful that that is going to come over and that is going to take part in Texas because that is an increase in K per nine. He lowered his walk per nine last year. He didn't give up as many homers. This is a guy, if you can get the innings out of him, is crazy, crazy valuable at low rounds that people are just not targeting. That has him around 140 innings. Like I said, this is like a goodwill version of uh, of uh, Jacob DeGrom. I love the strikeout numbers. I think Texas is going to be way better than people are giving credit for. So Andrew Heaney is a target. I think he's a sleeper. And if he gets 110, 120 innings, he is going to smash his value. Sorry, I just uh, still trying to yeah. come down from the Jacob DeGrom comparison there. But like I Jacob said, DeGrom, it's like you know. goodwill, goodwill, Jacob DeGrom. 13K per nine is the second best K minus oh, walk percentage was and also run. only pitched 70 innings. I mean, what it, else well, can I, I was give gonna you? Say, the, the most Jacob DeGrom S thing he can do <laughs> yeah. is give you 74 innings this year. That's probably going to be uh, somewhere in that range. All right, let's also, close things out. Better than his ERA. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let's All close right. things out with the closers. Uh, Justin Mason has a great piece on Fantasy Pros right now. The all undrafted team. And this guy's on it, Welsh. So let's talk about your relief pitcher. Uh, um, as far as relief pitchers go, this is interesting, the all-undrafted one. Uh, I've got Alexis Diaz with the Cincinnati Reds, who's actually out right now for the, um, I believe he's, I'm trying to remember what team he is, but he's out in the WBC. And Alexis Diaz is just one of those dudes that this is also, I believe he's brothers or cousins with Edwin Diaz. So you can obviously kind of get excited there. This is a bad team with a lockdown closer. So this is kind of like similar to like Daniel Bard, how you would view it, except I think the stuff can be bigger. Had a one eight four ERA last year. The worrisome stuff is the walk numbers are really high. And technically his XFIP was like, astronomically higher. So he got away with a lot of stuff, but it is big strikeout numbers, doesn't give up homers and he has the gig and he's going to keep down that gig for quite a while. So I think as far as the sleeper goes, uh, Ariel Cohen talked about Alex Lang. You could look at him. Mm -hmm. Daniel Bard is kind of fun with Colorado, but Alexis Diaz to me, I think has the most real true life closer stuff. And if that control can be a little bit under control, if you will, then Alexis Diaz has a potential to be like a top 12. I actually really think this is like into like Daniel Bard, where, you know, Daniel Bard, I guess you got him probably like 25th or something in closer, mm -hmm. and he could return top 15. I think Alexis Diaz is easy going to do that. And if he has a gig all year, controls those walks, I think he could finish top probably 10 in closers. So he's a guy that I'm trying to drop absolutely everywhere. Yeah, he's playing for uh, Team Puerto Rico. All right, uh, let's go Rico. for you. you, Steve Gardner. Close us out here. And this is a closer that I take in almost every mock draft that we do. He has very little uh, 
competition as far as I'm concerned. And I do agree with Welsh. I think Texas is going to be better than people realize. I'm not sure how. It's just they've just I can got think more of talent on their roster Jacob in the last year. Jacob DeGrom. So. Well, right. but no, but look, they went out there and they've spent money and they've brought in some major league talent. And that's something this roster has lacked for the last three years. Let's be honest. So that just off the bat is a good thing. So the yeah. closer there, Jose Leclerc, that's your guy, Steve. Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, if DeGrom and, and those guys can get further into the game and maybe take some of the pressure off of the bullpen in Texas to get it to the ninth inning, mm -hmm. uh, Jose Leclerc is going to be, uh, it seems to me, the, the no doubt closer there. They just did sign Will Smith um, this past week, who does have closing experience. But again, you like to see the right hander as the closer and, and use the left hander in situations. Um, and you know, coming back after Tommy John surgery a couple of years ago, um, made it back to the roster, throwing 96 again last year, and he has closing experience. I mean, he's he's done that for a couple of years, and now it seems like the job is his. Um, I think he's in a perfect situation, and you everybody is, seems to have forgotten about him, at least in drafts that I'm in, where you know nobody knows who's going to close for Texas because nobody had many saves for them. Um, He's the guy. He came back in, you know, towards the end of the year and took the job over. I think he's going to keep it all season long. And if you can get a closer who has the job all season long and not get traded, um, then you've got gold, especially where he's going. I love that we've come full circle here this week because after the show with Colette, he had so many of my favorite names on his all bus team. You've got a lot of names that I like, Steve Gardner, on your all sleeper team. So now I'm feeling a little bit better. I can rest easy. Those names are at catcher Yasmani Grandal at first, Brandon Belt, uh, Estrada, Candelario, Abrams make the rest of the infield. Then you've got Jesse Winker, Oscar Colas, Harrison Bader in the outfield. The pitchers, Giolito, Peralta, Molly, and Anderson, and the closer, Jose Leclerc. Welsh's all sleeper team, the sloppy yo hoppy, as Ariel Cohen calls him, Miguel Vargas. <laughs> Colton Wong, Max Muncy, Willie Adamas, uh, Lars Newtbar, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Taylor Ward, Lourdes Gurriel, J.D. Martinez, then Kirby Heaney and uh, Giolito with Alexis Diaz at the end. So some really good names there. Obviously, go practice getting these names on your roster over at fantasypros.com slash draft wizard or download the app. Run those mock draft simulations. we got a draft show, as I mentioned, coming up tomorrow with Bubba. We're going to do head-to-head -head roto categories. I think we should all draft right next to each other welsh what do you think like five six seven Ooh, wow. you think tomorrow? I actually think that's a, a pretty slick blood. idea yeah that's a yeah, great see idea if we're all friends after still i think we should yeah, do that I'll steve gardner go five. follow him on the twitter machine at steve a gardner he is first class for a reason one of the best guests Thank one you. of the best baseball people i've ever met and one of the big reasons i'm still kicking in this industry so steve just thank you again for your time and coming on, sharing your knowledge with everybody it's also one of the best fantasy baseball players out there too if you're ever in a league yep. with steve gardner I'm just going to tell you, he's going to kick your ass. Like, it's just, <laughs> I've, I've experienced it myself on more than one occasion. So one of the best there is. And check out the USA Today that's coming out, the special fantasy edition very soon. That'll do it for us. But the story of the game goes on. For Steven Welsh, I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids. <laughs>